Hey, Laura, I'm so excited for today. We have like we have like a big shot guest today, huh? We have an actual VIP, I think. Um, somebody who, yeah, has a lot of experience in the space, but uh, yeah, definitely has a finger on the pulse in all the things, regulatory, government, sometimes the scary stuff, but also has a wealth of experience. So yeah, looking forward to the conversation. And some silly stories about young Bill Gates. Oh, that's always going to be a winner. <laughs> well, let's get to it. As you know, we always like our guests to introduce themselves. And this week we have the wonderful Julie Inman Grant, also known as the Australian eSafety Commissioner. Julie, please, can you introduce yourself and maybe tell us a little bit about your background before you started this role? Sure. I'm Julie Inman Grant, the Australian eSafety Commissioner. I'm sure you're very confused because I have an American accent. You are not hearing wrong. Um, I actually started um, my career in Washington, D.C. in the early 1990s. I had big ideals and, of course, even bigger hair uh, at the time. And um, I really landed in tech policy ground zero. So I worked in con on Congress for my hometown congressman and I was working on a range of social justice issues. And he popped his head over the cubicle one day and said, hey, Julie, you know, you're working on these hard issues. Uh, we've got this small little uh, computer company in our electorate called Microsoft. Could you work on tech issues as well? So this was before there was even an internet. Um, and I ended up working in the education and nonprofit sector, going to graduate school at nights, um, studying the intersection between technology and society. And then I was uh, drafted by Microsoft to be one of their first lobbyists back in 1995. So right before the US DOJ antitrust um, challenge, um, I, think, I, I was- think that's, Is that back when Bill Gates still used to like lie on the, on the desk with the sweater on? Um, well, he, I'll have to tell you about my second day of work because um, I was so excited to meet um, my, my CEO um, and he landed, he really didn't like coming to Washington DC at the time. Um, you know, he just wanted to get on with it um, and, you know, create jobs and stimulate in innovation. So he arrived in um, chinos and a polo shirt and he was going to the White House and going to the um, press club. And so we had to ask our outside counsel to change out of his suit in the hotel lobby so that uh, <laughs> uh, Bill could have a suit. Uh, and then I took him over to the White House and he forgot his wallet and the um, security card wouldn't let him in. I said, but don't you, this is Bill Gates. He said, I don't care who you say you are. You're not getting into the White House with, without an ID. So, um, you know, um, it, it, was, it was very interesting. And then the next day, uh, the headline in the Washington Post was, oh, they're nice. it's unfortunate that we have to have a DC office. They're nice people, but they're just overhead. And I think that really describes the state of the broader tech sector today, where the starting point is, we just want to be left alone to innovate and create. And um, sorry if um, what we exfiltrate into the wild might be harming society. You know, you can't stand in the way of innovation. So I was I was part of that cabal. Um, I spent time at Twitter. Um, you know, was so excited uh, to join after the Arab Spring and speaking truth to power. But I very quickly saw how social media really surfaced the ills of society, of human nature, um, you know, through misogyny and racism and targeted online harassment, which was actually designed and effective in silencing voices. And then I spent some time at Adobe um, and uh, then I got recruited in as a poacher turned gamekeeper and I now regulate the tech sector. I, I, now you have kids, right? I've got three. How do you how right do you, in the sweet spot? How do you how do you how do you manage like being a big time government official and also having kids? I'm just an author and I struggle with my kids. Uh, well, I am taking a three week vacation. It's the first time in 30 years that I'm not bringing my laptop. Wow. Um, so um, and this this was on doctor's orders to just, you know, um, disconnect, which I think we we all need to do. So I've got a 17 year old. Um, and I remember when she was three years old, 
And she was more fascinated with my phone and the lights and the gooey than she was the doll. And I remember thinking, wow, these kids, this was 14 years ago, are going to grow up very differently. So I also have 11 year old twins uh, who are in the upper end of primary school. Now they claim that they're the only two kids in sixth grade that don't have a phone. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually inclined to believe them. Um, so so we're, right now they, they do have access in the house. They, they use my account when they're trying to connect with friends so I can see everything that's being said. But, you know, it's really hard not to bring what I see and what my investigators see every day with child sexual abuse material, including self-generated content, um, seeing that the um, age of cyberbullying has gone down um, from 14, eight years ago when we started, um, to starting in the upper primary years. So we, we have eight and nine-year-olds reporting serious cyberbullying to us. Um, and this is a sort of interesting hangover of the pandemic where I think we were all struggling as parents to uh, remotely work and school. And so we were a little bit more permissive with technology. But once you hand over a smartphone or put your kid on TikTok at eight or nine years old, you can't ratchet that back. So, yeah. So, so, so what do you so, you know, as a as the as the commissioner, how, how do you think about that as a, a, a from, from a policy standpoint? Like what can governments do about that? Well, listen, I I think, um, you know, the approach we take is um, is, I think, a unique one that we've developed over time because there were no other online safety regulators and we had to write the playbook as we went along. Um, but before we even use our regulatory powers and we have complaint schemes and takedown powers and high levels of success, and now we have some systemic regulatory powers, we have to start with prevention. Um, through education and fundamental research, building the, the evidence base. So everything I heard the Surgeon General say uh, last month, um, you know, are, are issues that we've been gathering evidence about and advising parents and educators and even young people themselves uh, through, through a co-design process um, about healthy use of technology. You know, there's so much, there's so much Mix, mixed outcomes um, in, in the research. And I, I do worry about um, cause, direct causal links being drawn to, you know, social media is bad. Um, it leads to mental health issues. Um, and we had a terrible situation in 2018 where there was a tragic suicide um, of, an eight, of a 14 year old girl. And it was all attributed to cyberbullying when of course you know that there are much more complex things going in the background. And what I worry about when, when adults in the media draw that direct causal link is that children won't engage in help seeking and they will think that taking their own life or doing something more drastic is the way out. Um, and, and, and of course, I think we're the only government in the world that has a youth-based cyberbullying service where we serve as that safety net when a child, their parent, carer, or an educator reports anything seriously threatening, intimidating, humiliating, um, or harassing, and it doesn't come down, um, we're that safety net. And we advocate on behalf of that child and have a 90% success rate in terms of getting that content taken down, which goes a long way to relieving the mental distress that young people experience from not just acute cyberbullying, like death threats and rape threats, which we do see from teenagers, but just the uh, garden variety, being mean, creating drama, starting rumors, which can have a very corrosive impact on, on children's lives. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Julie. Um, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with you for many years in my previous work where I, you know, worked on helplines and so on. And, you know, when Australia was the first country to have this regulatory responsibility, um, so what sort of power specifically do you have? I know you've just touched on a couple of things, a couple of questions on that. So how do industry respond to it? And also how is it received by general citizens and people in the country? Uh, well, thank you for those questions. So we, um, you know, as countries around the world are considering legislation, for instance, the, the online safety bill is actively being debated in the U UK Parliament, the House of Lords, I believe right now. Ireland just set up um, an online safety commissioner. Of course, we'll see a proliferation of 
of um, regulators through the uh, Digital Services Act. Um, we've already reformed our legislation. So, um, you know, the, the, the um, formation of the eSafety Commissioner, we actually started as the Children's eSafety Commissioner, but it came about because a, a, a well-known female presenter from Australia's Next Top Model, so the, the Tyra Banks of Australia, was very open about mental health issues. She had a nervous breakdown. She was getting terrible trolling on Twitter and she came out of her recovery and got right back on Twitter. And um, I was interviewing for Twitter at the time. So I remember seeing what was playing out. She ultimately ended up taking her life and it was referred to as the Twitter suicide. Now this spawned a petition that went to government um, that said, you know, government needs to, to step in. This is 2014. But what the government of the day decided to do was start small and slow with the Children's Safety Commissioner because they were concerned about things like freedom of expression and the, the specter of censorship. So they started with the, the hotline um, function that we already have in terms of taking reports of child sexual abuse material. And uh, we've had that function like the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children for more than 20 years. And then they created this new uh, youth-based cyberbullying uh, scheme. So again, not to be proactive monitors of the internet or to do the content moderation job for the companies, but to serve as that safety net. Um, and I have to say, so that's how we started. Um, we have a very good relationship with the platforms. They get huge volumes of reports. Often the content moderation is outsourced and a content moderator from another country who doesn't understand the culture and the context may have 30 seconds to a minute to decide whether or not that um, violates the company's terms of service. So they get it wrong. I mean, if you look at the, the latest Meta Oversight uh, Board report, something like 1.3 million um, requests for reviewing decisions were made. They only got to 50 mm. and um, more than half of them were found to be um, wrong decisions. So we do that day in and day out on a daily basis as, a, as an objective third party, but we always prefer to use informal means because that gets, tech, that gets um, the content down more expeditiously. We know the more quickly we get that content down, the more relief we provide to the children. We also in work with schools and parents because cyberbullying tends to be peer to peer. Um, it's, it's an extension of conflict, which is happening within the schoolyards. So, and it's, as you know, very visible to young people and their peers, but often hidden to teachers and parents, um, particularly as things start moving to SNAP and to DM and that sort of thing. So we started with that. We moved to um, what the government asked me to set up was a revenge porn portal. And I, I, I know you, you did some pioneering work at the revenge porn hotline, but my first inclination was, no, I'm not gonna call it a revenge porn portal. Um, that that can, revenge for what? That can lead to victim blaming. Let's call it what it is, image-based abuse. And we set that up in 2017 and um, got much more potent powers in 2018. Um, we've helped tens and thousands of Australians get um, intimate imagery um, taken down um, from all over the internet. Um, we're starting to get reports of deep fake pornography. Mm -hmm. So that's starting to be democratized. But one huge um, change that we've seen that's of huge concern, I think, to, to hotlines all over the globe is that we've had seen a tripling of reports of sexual extortion. Um, and it's totally uh, changed the demographics of those we're helping on its head. You know, re relationship retribution in terms of the sharing of intimate images and videos, that garden variety um, revenge porn or non-consensual sharing of intimate imagery tends to impact women and girls. But 90% of the reports we're getting around sexual extortion, which is backed by organized crime, is 90% are young men and boys, um, mostly between the ages of 18 and 24, but also um, hitting younger male teens. Uh, I'm going to step out of that for a second. I know you've done a lot of a lot of work on on, on gender based harassment and abuse. I know you're working uh, with 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 other governments too around uh, around the world. And I guess I have a I have a question. Like you know, I think we all know there's a ton of misogyny and homophobia and transphobia online. Like the, the, but but also offline. And and I I guess I'm wondering like 
is the online world increasing that kind of harassment? Is it making it worse, or is the online world actually just making it more apparent? Right, Make, taking it out of the out of the dark places and 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 making us a lot more aware of what already exists. Jordan, I think that's a great question. Uh, I think, as I said, I think online misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, racism is a reflection. Um, of those ills existing in society, but you're amplifying it and putting on steroids when it's happening um, on mm -hmm. social media. And what we really worry about, particularly about when it's out in the open or it's targeting um, people in the spotlight, um, politicians, journalists, those in sport, is that it normalizes that kind of behavior. Right. And right. I think, um, you know, people's people's, you know, I don't think, you know, getting rid of anonymity will um, solve the issue because there are plenty of people who are happy to let <laughs> let their um, identity be be known and, you know, continue to say um, horrible things. I mean, let's look at the the Andrew Tates um, of the world. Um, they're being glorified um, for their misogyny to a certain degree. Um, but I, I, I know it has an amplification effect. So we've signed MOUs with 30 um, different sporting codes across Australia. Um, and one of the reasons is the AFL is the Australian Football League. Um, every year there's an indigenous round. Um, it's the highest um, level of online abuse they see targeting their players. And when you speak to these players, I mean, they're experiencing daily racism as it is. And then they have this additional burden of being a professional athlete and being a role model for their community. Um, and so when they're threatened and their families are threatened and you know racial epithets are being thrown at them, it, it just, it compounds the daily misery that they um, experience. So we see a lot of people stepping out of sport early. Um, we certainly see a lot of women. I mean, you know, draw whatever conclusions you will about Nicola Sturgeon, and Jacinda Dern stepping down. Um, but one of the reasons I started the um, Women in the Spotlight program was because women who are in the public eye are receiving outsized um, amounts of, you know, the, pre the prevalence of abuse is so much higher, but it's also manifest differently. You know, you don't see men re copying abuse about, um, you know, they're losing their hair and their middle-aged tire. But about when it's it's about rape, it's violent, it's sexualized, it's about their appearance, their supposed virtue, um, their fertility. So nothing seems to be um, out of bounds when it comes to online misogyny. And uh, this is now expen extending to the broader public. So we just did a survey of um, women in professional life and one in three have experienced online abuse as as, as a result of being online in the context of their job. And about a quarter of them said that they will not take opportunities or promotions that require them to be on social media or in the media because it's just not worth it to, to them. Now, to me, that shows it's entrenching gender quality. Uh, these same women tell us that they self-censor. Um, and that's what targeted online harassment is designed to do is to silence voices. So when people tell me I'm I'm being a censor, you know, engaging in the takedown of content, I, I kind of point out that not only is freedom of expression, you know, not absolute, not even in accordance with the First Amendment, but when you start targeting people and silencing them, you're actually suppressing freedom of expression. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, you, you said you've talked about so many things that are that are, that are really really scary. So, <laughs> so for for our listeners, uh, the, the 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 parents, the educators, the 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 the, the sort of everyday uh, users of, of of the internet, are there like what would be some like top advice that you that you'd get that you'd give us in terms of thinking about it? I don't want everyone listening to this to go, oh no, there's such horrors. No, um, you know, it, it, it is tough. So um, we've done a lot of work around um, the pedagogy of online safety education and what works and what doesn't. You know, uh, scaring people or judging parents uh, tends to lead to amygdala hijack and, you know, people shut down. We also know that um, doing the same with kids and just doing one-off presentations is, is not going to help them. And I happen to believe that just banning <laughs> 
banning devices rather than teaching um, what I call the four R's of the digital age, respect, responsibility, and building digital resilience and critical reasoning skills. If we're not teaching kids these skills and regulation, um, self-regulation of technology use, then we're not setting them up for success in the future. I'd say the same thing about AI. So I just say to parents that um, you are the front lines of defense. We are the ones that tend to hand over the, the digital device. Um, in Australia, 42% of two-year-olds have access to a digital device. And by the time they're four-year-old, it's 94%. So um, on our website, esafety.gov.au, we've got a parent's guides for under fives. And the key messages there um, to be delivering to kids are be safe, be kind, ask for help, uh, make good choices and then when they get into the primary years it really is about as i said those four r's of the digital age um sitting down um signing family tech agreements we know that kids are much more likely um to adhere to family technology uh, use rules when they're part of the decision making process we've got um, a number of those for for young families um, all of this is free um, the key advice that I, I, I give to parents is, is really speak early and often to your kids, keep the lines of communication open, let kids know they can come to you if anything goes wrong online. Uh, a lot of kids are worried about device denial, um, so they won't confide in their parents or they don't think that they can help them. But if you start by asking those questions at the dinner table, we ask our kids about school, we ask them about sport, Ask them what they're experiencing online. Um, cope, co-play and co-view. Um, I, I could never keep up with my kids on Roblox. I'm like, how the heck are they, you know, six years old and how do they know how to do that? Um, but it, it's something that, um, you know, I, I wanted to know who they were playing with um, when we set the parental controls. I make sure my kids use technology in open areas of the house so I can see how they're um, reacting to it. Um, so I, often when, um, you know, kids are being cyberbullied, you, you, you'll see a visceral reaction they will have um, to reading the paper. And that, that also includes, um, you know, when kids are playing Fortnite or gaming, you might, have, um, you might have them wearing headphones, but if you really want to hear what they're experiencing, um, make sure, again, that's in open areas of the house and you can, you can hear what they're uh, experiencing as well. Uh, yeah, I love that advice, Julie. And as a, you know, both of us are parents, and Jordan and I talk about these topics all the time, and many other guests too. And I think that's really good advice. The it sounds so simple, but actually, it's things that do become quite challenging for people. Actually, to to be, just be, as you say, present, to co-play, to co-participate, to role model as well. I think that's really, really great advice is just be there with your kids on this journey, exactly as you said, as you would uh, talking about everything else that they do in life and trying to make that as normal a conversation as opposed to it being a let's sit and have the talk. Um, so one of the things you literally just mentioned was around kind of the VR and the AR stuff that's happening. Um, we know that you've been involved with the World Economic Forum around some of this really proactive conversations about the metaverse or what the future of Web 3.0 is going to look like. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that work and, you know, some of the potential concerns, problems, but also the positives that maybe the metaverse might bring? Sure. Um, well, I'm going to go a little bit backwards um, to um, a pillar that's also very important to what we do, and it's what I call proactive and systemic change. And so that's staying ahead of tech trends, understanding how these technologies can be harnessed for good and for benefit and what the potential risks are um, and, and how we might be able to mitigate them before these these technologies become mainstream. Um, and safety by design is key to that. Um, so 10 years ago, I tried, when I was um, Microsoft's head of global privacy and safety, I tried to bring safety by design to Microsoft at a time when they were becoming an enterprise company and didn't own LinkedIn um, and you know, thought that really applied to social media. Um, so, you know, I wasn't successful there as an internal safety antagonist and, um, you know, I did my best at Twitter too. Um, so one of the first things that I did was 
engage with the industry and, and um, consult with them for over nine months um, on what meaningful safety by design would look like and focusing on those three pillars of what are what is service level, service provider responsibility? What does good user autonomy and um, empowerment look like? And then what does meaningful transparency and accountability look like? So as you know, that that project evolved over time. We've developed a range of risk assessment tools. We did that with industry rather than to industry. And Roblox was one of the first um, companies to get on board. And you know, I think fundamentally because you understand that <laughs> if you're building a platform for kids, you know, safety has to be a core consideration. And you need to make sure that the experience is is safe and it's it's not toxic and that you're staying ahead of these things. And so I applied those same principles when we were looking at immersive technologies in the metaverse, because it's going to make everything high sensory and hyper realistic. Right. And so we think yeah. about the impact yeah. on young people. It's it's going to be more visceral, visceral and more extreme. Um, and the tools that are developed today aren't probably going to be fit for purpose, you know, in terms of blocking and muting. Not that they're going to have like a digital cop on the metaverse beat, um, but maybe maybe we need something like a um, eject button or emergency call button, because this is going to be happening in real time. Um, so it's really conduct uh, more than content that we'll be focused on. And when your kids have their um, AR, VR glasses on, you're not going to be seeing what's happened to them unless you're doing something like you're casting that onto a screen, which right now is pretty expensive. And we want safety to be fundamental and imperative and not a separate service that parents have to pay for. So very much around the education piece from us educating as a tech person, as it were. So tech companies, governments, policymakers and NGOs and, and civil society are about educating families and parents and kids and users and everyone who's using the Internet to just build that resilience and have the skills and tools, as well as having the tools, I think, is kind of. Yeah, yeah. that sounds great. It's just the perfect the perfect analogy. I don't know if you remember writing in the front seat of your parents station wagon, I had wood panel station wagon, um, you know, that big but. but bench seat without seat belts on. Um, that was in the you know 70s. And that was around the time that Ralph Nader wrote Unsafe at Any Speed. I think he actually wrote it in 65, but started to get traction where governments all over the world um, you know, legislated the embedding of seat belts. And the car manufacturers vehemently pushed back at the time. Now we get into our cars and we take for granted that seat belts are there and there are airbags and anti-lock brakes and companies actually compete on their safety rec record to have the safest car. So we need that same kind of mentality to be really infusing uh, across the technology sector rather than moving fast and breaking things. It's You can still move fast and be nimble. You just need to think about the risks and embed those safety protections up front. I don't see it as a friction point. I see that as um, a different differentiator and something that will um, supplement the user experience and something that we should think about making good business sense. Yeah, yeah well, you're, well, you're preaching to the choir here, but uh, hope, hopefully, hopefully, uh, hopefully other people are listening. Um, um, so let me ask you the, 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 the uh, I, I guess our, our, our last question is, is for you is like, what's the, what are the issues that nobody's really thinking about? Like even, even your own team, like the things that you think that where we, where we're not focusing yet that we need to, like, what, what are the future questions? Well, I think the thinking is, is, is evolving, but, um, one that really scares me is neurotechnology. Um, again, it's another example of a technology that could have tremendous benefits, you know, for people with neurological disorders, um, you know, who are paralyzed, um, there could, you know, nanotechnology, all of these things, but like any technology, they can, it can, it can be used as a tool or a weapon. I think, I think James is coughing um, and it's not on, on mute. Matt, can you put, I think you can put James on mute. <laughs> Hi, James. Um, I, I lost my train of thought. 
Uh, oh, I was just saying nan yeah, nanotechnology, neurotechnology. You know, again, we're all coming late to the party with AI. Um, AI has been around a very long time, but of course, I think it all kind of hit us like a tsunami. Um, and, you know, what I, what, and so now governments are scrambling to think about legislating and put, putting that genie back in the bottle. And that's what we try and do. And I think we as governments need to do better is engage with the industry, find out what's coming, anticipate um, what might be coming, um, how we can harness it for good and how, how, how things could go wrong. And this is where I think safety by design is going to apply to neurotechnology and nanotechnology and quantum and immersive and generative AI. I wouldn't be surprised if governments start to actually legislate safety by design and say, show us that the guardrails you're embedding um, are making um, are, a difference, that they're meaningful, rather than waiting till all of this is out in the wild and unleashed in humanity. And you can't really, um, you're playing just a big game of whack-a-mole or whack-a-troll, whatever you, you, you want to call it. Yeah. Um, One of the things I really love, Julie, is, um, you know, for example, when we think about AI, as you say, it has been around for a very long time and it is part of the, or um, architecture of the internet what we're seeing now is a huge and very quick evolution of the technology but from sometimes from a policymaker point of view there's a bit of a lack of understanding where this is the first time they're really hearing about it so they're really frightened so you know we're grateful for you know organizations like yours and others around the world who are actually helping to educate of it doesn't mean it's all bad but you really need to understand the bigger picture and you know these these bits are essential and these bits maybe we need to have a little bit more of a handle on and definitely as you said the speed of how things are happening um it would be really good for us to be having those conversations collectively much earlier I agree with that I think so too. And I think policymakers are key. I was just listening to a hard fork uh, podcast um, with Cecilia Kang, uh, Kevin Roos and Casey Newton. And, you know, they were, t they were pl playing um, questions that some of the um, um, senators were asking different technology leaders. Um, and I remember having that experience when we were supporting Bill Gates in the antitrust trials before the judiciary committee. Um, they just didn't understand technology. And, you know, I've tried to inject myself into shaping some of the legislation that we are going to have to implement because sometimes great policy ideas seem great on paper, but when it comes to implementation, they can have unintended consequences or they can be relatively impossible to implement. So good policy design is, is critical. And that means you need to have a fundamental understanding of how that's going to um, you know, really replicate throughout the um, technology ecosystem. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, well, thank you so much, Julie. Like you just, you, I've got so much going on in my head right now. So many, so many, so many, so many thoughts. Is, is there anything that we, that we should, that we should have asked about that we didn't? Um, no, I'm sorry if I, I went all over the place and um, I was oh, getting yeah, excited about, about this um, as, as well. I, again, I, I guess I just um, also mentioned that one of the things we did, uh, we announced in Washington, D.C. in November last year was the creation of a global online safety regulators network. Um, and so as as a um, lone regulator who kind of felt like they were, you know, climbing up a humongous hill at the front of the Pentagon, Peloton with no one uh, drafting behind us, we we do have um, organizations around the globe joining us and we believe that we need to work together. Um, we can learn from each other, that we can share intelligence and information and make sure that there isn't a splinter net uh, of, of regulation and that what we're, we're all doing is, is harnessing the benefits and the good. AI is a perfect example of a use case that could have tremendous power in in helping humans with content moderation on the internet and you know search out and sweep out um, illegal or seriously harmful content so we want to see those positive use cases but we also want to minimize the risks and we need to do that as governments together 
huge congratulations on that initiative, Julie. Um, I'm yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to see where things go in the next couple of years. But I think we're all really grateful for the work that you and your team do um, for leading the charge. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, so much. You. thank you. And thank you so much for coming on our podcast, Julie. <laughs> thank you. Oh, my gosh. Um, what fun. Um, what a great way for me to start the day. Um, uh, again, I'm sorry I can't see you. I'd much rather this be a sort of a conversation, and I, I hope I didn't talk too much. I, you know, six and a half years into this job, I still get excited about um, what we do. And, you know, I'm very proud of the the content on the, the website. Um, you know, it's it's been co-developed with communities and uh, just met with them. Um, uh, Commissioner Bedoya, who was out here um, from the FTC and had an earlier meeting with um, Commissioner Slaughter, I reckon if the you know the the U.S. did did come on board, it seems like there's a lot of activity in Congress. Who knows what will actually happen? That there could just be such a huge difference in if it's the right <laughs> if it's the right approach in. Um, you know, really rooting out bad bad actors more so than the the platforms themselves, because it is it is people that misuse the technology, um, not necessarily the technology that is. Um, I don't believe technology is totally neutral. It depends on the design, but mm -hmm. um, we we are often dealing, as you know, with bad human behavior <laughs> this is very too julie and actually i might ask that we can keep that little sound bite of you saying you know i've been doing this job for six years and i'm still excited about what we're doing because i think that was just a beautiful <laughs> after some of the conversation that's obviously very serious i think that was a, a beautiful comment that you're still really passionate about what you're doing so it it's it's apparent <laughs> it, it it does it does help um it it, it it also helps because you know how hard this is um, and you're not talking down to parents. You're not wagging your finger at kids like you're, you know, heading up the McNanny state, how you talk to people and how you empower them to learn. Um, and it, it is really important. What we haven't quite cracked is how do we reach that broader cadre of parents um, the really engaged parents are the same ones that go to the website, that are engaged in their kids' online lives, that show up at the presentations we do and the webinars we do, um, but reaching that broader cohort of parents, 95% of parents say that this is their preeminent parenting ch yeah. challenge, online safety, but only 10% yeah. will actually seek out information until something goes wrong. And less, so and less, of, less of them access the parental controls as well from a platform perspective. It's a really difficult issue. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure you're you're you feel like you're sh shouting into a cavern. The parental controls are there. All you need to do is turn them on. Yeah. So one of the things that we're doing with our codes is um, working with the different. Um, eight different sectors of the economy, but we're, we're going to require that um, hardware providers, um, you know, when you're selling phones at the, or consoles at the store, that they provide online safety information, um, may, maybe not in the box, they can tape it to the box, we don't care how, but <laughs> we make sure that we're, we're getting that information to parents. Love that. Well, I, well, I feel safe right. no, no, knowing that you're doing this work, so. Yeah, oh, thank you so much, Julie. This has been a lovely so conversation. Um, yeah, Love so we, you, but... oh, it's been wonderful. Thank you. And as I say, thank you for everything you and your team do. Um, we're still wrapping the series. We, I think we have one, two left two to record. Um, and so we'll be in touch really soon about potential launch dates and everything. Obviously, we'd be super grateful if you're happy to put stuff out on your channel. Um, but of we'll course. be in touch as soon as as soon as we have more info for you. But yeah, thank Excellent. you so much. Always a pleasure, thank Julie. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Take Bye. care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.
Thanks for listening to Into the Digital Future. We hope you had as much fun listening as we had talking. For links and resources about any of the ideas, projects, or initiatives we discussed on this episode, please visit the Cooney Center website at cooneycenter.org slash future. Into the Digital Future has been brought to you by Roblox and the Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop. Your hosts are Jordan Shapiro and Laura Higgins. Matt Clark is our audio editor and production coordinator. We invite you to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any episodes on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher and more.